Okay, hi guys. So here I am in order to talk about a, to a topic that I believe that is of extreme importance to teenagers nowadays. But before I get into the title of my presentation, I want you to do a mental exercise, to picture a hypothetical situation. So, this hypothetical situation has a lot of steps, which I want you to picture. Okay. So the first step is the start of your day. So you wake up, and recently you've been feeling a little bit unproductive, right? And especially when you compare your routine with what you heard or have seen from your friends. And so, from what you've heard or seen, your friends seem like geniuses that do work, that do projects and assignments weeks, weeks before they're due, and they study diligently for the test and do well. And on the other side, well, <laughs> as you can see, but by the turn in late assignment, you aren't doing so great. You struggle to do projects, you struggle with motivation, and you can't seem to focus and do anything in an organized manner. So that makes you feel a little bit sad and anxious. So you need something that will make you feel happier, something that will distract you from the problem, from the troubles that you're having. And so you resort to the second step of our situation, which is social media, right? It ends up being a terrible idea because after five minutes of scrolling through your friends' stories and posts, you see that their romantic relationships, their travel plans, hopefully not during COVID-19, and their professional lives, be studying or working, seem so perfect, and yours simply don't. So you feel worse than before. Because now you're feeling unproductive and like your life is really bad, especially when compared to others. And so you need something that will really take you out of that bad thing. Something that will distract you a lot. And so you go to the ultimate weapon slash plan for everyone that's feeling a little bit down. Which is to procrastinate by binge watching series, watching YouTube videos, or playing with you, right? And in defense of these methods, they work you feel a little bit happier and you feel distracted from the problems in your real life. So you continue doing it, right? An episode or two won't hurt. You feel better and then you continue with the day normally being more productive. Well, as it turns out, as in a magic trick, the day has started at 10 a.m. with your problems. In the blink, in the blink of an eye, it's turning to 10 p.m. and the whole day is gone and two episodes turning to 10 or playing a level from the game turning to playing the entire game with your friends. And so the day is over, and, and you feel even worse than before. Because such a little feeling um, cascaded and grew into something so big that you ended up losing your entire day for it. And so you, you feel a little bad, and then you go to sleep, and that's the end of your day. I want to ask you something. Have you ever felt that? Way? Has that ever happened to you? Maybe not exactly in the way that I described, but in some sort or shape or fashion, I believe it has happened to you. And I hope it has happened to you, and not because I hate you, but because if don't, then my presentation has no purpose. So we get to the title of my presentation, which is Living on Automatic. The life of a teenager in the 21st century. It seems a little bit dramatic, I'll admit, but it's the focus of it. So before I get into the presentation itself, um, I want to do this quick. I know that mm, some of these scenarios might apply to other age groups. And well, we're living in the same world, world after all. But I want to focus on teenagers mainly because of my experience, because I have suffered a lot from it during my teenage years, which I still am at, but that will be my focus. And so I'll talk about the factors that I think automatize us, especially when we're suffering from anxiety and prevent us from doing stuff fully, and as I might put it. So the first factor is something that I call survivorship bias. And survivorship bias can be defined by the sentence, uh, up there. it's from Wikipedia, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, sue me, that was the easiest definition to find. But to put it simply, um, survivorship bias means that you only see and take into account what validates your point, and you tend to forget or ignore what doesn't. A very good example of that is done by social media. Social media does that to you without you even noticing, because social media is a place where people tend to publish the perfect sides of their lives when they're feeling happy, when they're having an awesome travel, when they're with their friends having fun, when they're at a party, whenever they're happy, whenever they did an awesome drawing. And more often than not, people don't, don't post whenever they're feeling sad, whenever they're feeling a little bit depressed, a little bit down, or they're having a completely ordinary and normal day. 
So that makes us believe that other people's lives are much better than when they die, dark. Especially because you see the entirety of your life. The good and bad moments. And on social media you only see the perfect sides of other people's lives. And, but not only social media, we also do that in real life. As a personal example, um, I often, whenever I'm feeling sad, I'm trying to compare myself to others. I tend to remember much more the, the moments in which my friends were in front of me and they had studied diligently and rigorously for the tests. And they were confident and I wasn't, instead of the moments in which I did the opposite, in which I studied and prepared myself well, and the others did. So by forgetting the moments in which I did better, I tend to compare myself and feel as if I were inferior to some of my colleagues, which isn't something that is helpful. And the second point is something that I decided to label too much. Um, to put it simply, it, it can be resumed by one question. Have you ever felt like being a teenager was too much? Not too much in the sense of difficulty, but as if there was too much stuff going on. Social media, YouTube, video games, and your own problems, your own real life problems, they tend to accumulate a lot and then your brain tends to overwork things and then you, you just need to sit down for a day or two because you just feel as if it's too much. Well, the internet and social media and games do that to us by something that is called overstimulation. And I decided to label it between two main categories, which are instant gratification and instant solutions. The best example to instant gratification is something that is very easy and fast to do, but makes you feel better about yourself. The perfect example of that would be the like on Instagram, Facebook, and other social media platforms. It's something that is so easy. It's simply someone pressing one button, and it makes you feel so happy about it. You haven't worked that hard for it, yet it makes you feel good. Sometimes you post something that you maybe are not that proud of, but simply because you need some external validation from your friends. So you post it. The other is called instant solutions. And referring back to the hypothetical situation that I told you, and whenever you're feeling a little bit unproductive and like you couldn't do stuff, and you feel like a sudden surge of motivation and decided to binge on YouTube so that you could become a new person, and then you found those videos like, 10 ways to become more productive, or seven habits that productive people have. And you watched it, maybe you might have implemented this, these tips for a day or two, but in the end you returned back to being the same person, and it didn't feel like it had that big of an impact. Wow. It made you feel better in the moment, so you solved the problem in the short term, but the problem with them is that it makes you believe that those problems, some and most problems in life, can be solved easily. And simply by watching a YouTube video and trying to implement it a day or two without putting much thought into it will solve the problem. Which more often than not isn't the case. And so you avoid dealing with the problem, maybe even suffering from it and learning with your suffering. And that can be a problem. And well, this overstimulation and instant gratification lead to problems three and four. Problem three is development of character and resilience, or lack thereof. Um, so, instant gratification leads to little to no resilience um, in the fact that whenever you, as you have learned from instant solutions, whenever you deal with a problem too quickly, or you simply forget about it because you felt better, um, you're pushing the problem away. You're not dealing with it, you're not facing it, you're not solving it through suffering a little bit, and reflection. So, you develop little resilience. You don't know how to deal with problems, because you're, you're used to simply watching a YouTube video about it and solving it, or searching the answer to your test in the internet and simply copying and pasting it, and then it's done. So, whenever there's a situation that really requires you to work harder about it, and focus yourself, and discipline yourself, you want to it. And the second part is development of character, which is something that is a little bit accurate, but I believe that your character is composed of things that you like and things that you don't. Things that you did well and things that you didn't do well. They're part of you. And by eliminating the negative parts, the things that you don't like and the things that you do badly, because there's an instant solution and an instant gratification to it, it was an essential part of your character, which is the bad part of yourself. The bad part of yourself. And Fourth point 
is it deprives you of good experiences. I know that I sound like an annoying parent telling the children, their children to get out of the video game in order to walk, walk outside or to do some exercise because you three days, three days in a row playing this video game. And yeah, I know it sounds annoying, I have been annoyed children, but well, sometimes you really do lose on other things that are good, that are in real life. And as a personal example, I am someone that likes to walk around in nature and appreciate it. And often whenever we're traveling, I like to sit in, in, in a place that has a lot of nature and has a good view and simply stay there for hours and appreciate the view. But whenever I'm in these trances, and at home especially, I tend to forget uh, to do those things because there's a part here by now. And simply because playing video games, watching YouTube videos, or binge watching some series simply seems so much more appealing and much more fun at the moment than doing things that I really know that I like. So you end up losing on that too. And well, I talked about the aspects and the theory, but you need to see in practice, right? You need to, to see someone trying to deal with it. So that's what I'm trying to, to express now. And a disclaimer. This is not a success story in any way, but it's just to illustrate you with my struggles. So before I get into the steps themselves, um, I need to give you a little background. Um, especially in elementary school, I was a very good student that managed to go by without putting much effort into projects and, and work that we had to do. Um, I studied only the day before the test and I managed to do well, so I never felt the urge to have a or an organized study schedule and to have an organized way to do my homework and to study at home. So, there's that. On top of that, I'm a very anxious person. Um, I get easily disturbed and distracted and nervous whenever something doesn't go my way and lastly, I'm a perfectionist. So, I really like everything that I submit to be perfect. I don't like to turn in work that I don't feel confident about and so whenever you, you put all those factors together, it is kind of disaster, right? Because whenever something doesn't go my way and it becomes a little bit harder than I can do without putting much effort, I will collapse. Which is something that happened in some shape or form during high school. So now we go to the attempts. And in my struggle for perfection. The first one was an app called Tomatic, which a friend of mine introduced me to. And so the 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 core idea of Kabirika is to gamify productiveness. It, it, it sort of has a, a, an interface that makes you believe that you're playing an RPG game, which your character develops by doing tests that you develop and you create for yourself, such as doing homework, meditating, doing exercise. So I felt, well, I'm a person that loves to play video games. So as long as I gamify it, I will feel like I'm, a game. I'm in a game and I will be productive, right? It did, for a month or so, before I ended up forgetting to do it one day and then I never really worried about it anymore. It might be on my phone, and with some tasks from 2018 that aren't done, so that's the figure. The second attempt was something that was more physical, less digital. It was having a physical notebook with me in which I would do the things that I had to do for the day and I wrote schedules and things to do, when to do this and well, it worked for two weeks before I forgot it at home and now I use it to write random drivers that come to mind instead of organizing myself. So that was a failure as well. The third attempt was to meditate and I need to give credit where credit's due. It lasted for two good months and it really worked well because it really brought me to a state of peace of mind. So I managed to concentrate and do stuff organizedly. But after doing the, the free trial of 10 sessions from Headspace for the sixth time, I believe, I gave up on it and, well, it's still on my cell phone as all the other apps, but didn't work either. So that's a failure. The fourth attempt was to have a whiteboard. Um, I bought that whiteboard in January this year, I believe, and I wrote all the stuff that I had to do, which is quite a lot if you look at it. Some things were were um, erased, but yeah, 
there was a lot of stuff to do and as you might see by the picture which may yet was taken today the 4th of December of 2020 what? 8 months after that and as you might see there's still a lot of things a lot of things in there that are unchecked so I didn't do it the paint has dried in the whiteboard because I haven't touched it in like 5 months so there was a failure as well the 5th attempt may yet was a little bit more radical because I believe that the source of my problems was myself and social media. So I decided to go into a non-digital phase of my life. I threw my cell phone away, I gave it to my parents and installed that app that blocks all other applications. And I blocked 90% of the apps on my phone. I believe I even blocked my calculator for some reason. I don't know why I think I would lose some time playing with a calculator, but I did it anyways. And it put me into some deep trouble, into some situations in media in which I needed to call an Uber home, but I had a phone, so that was funny as well. But after a week or so, I noticed that I couldn't leave, or it would be much harder to leave without a cell phone nowadays, so that was the end of that as well. I used my cell phone until today. And the last attempt was using organizational apps and watching organizational videos on YouTube. And if you've paid attention to the presentation, you know that that doesn't work as well. Um, I have Microsoft to do and to do is on my computer, and it still has tasks on it that are from July, I believe. So that's a failure as well. And well, that's what that was the end of it. I didn't find any perfect solution. And so we reached the conclusion. And there's an important question. Here I am, right? And nothing bad has happened to me. My life hasn't ended. I. I'm fairly confident in what I did, I'm fairly happy and proud of what I did, so I didn't find a perfect solution to my anxiety, but here I am, I managed to do the TED presentation, procrastinated it may yet, but it's finished. And so we now reach the conclusion, I'm sorry. <laughs> and there's another question, which is why did I tell you all that? The the aspects and the factors and my personal embarrassing story with organization. Why did I tell you? I already told you that there's no magical solution to it. I won't tell you that by doing what I did, you might solve your problems with anxiety and procrastination. But, well, maybe if you, if you think about my experiences, the things I did and the things I described, you might reach your own solution. It might not be perfect, it might not solve all your anxiety, but it might improve a bit. Another thing that I had in mind is empathy. If you felt like someone understood you and had gone through the same things as you, as I believe you have done as well, and you have struggled with anxiety, and so by seeing someone that has gone through the same things as you, you might feel better. And if it manages to improve your day even a little bit, and you have some laughs from me, that will be a big W, in my opinion. And lastly, the lasting change I want you to have, even if it's a very small one, is a change in mentality, which can be perfectly summarized by the sentence, no need to be perfect. There's no need to be perfect. And nowadays we live in a society that values and strives for perfection so much that we have forgotten sometimes that you don't need to be perfect, that you can be perfect. And I would strongly argue that human beings can be perfect. Um, and in an era in which everyone posts the perfect sides of their lives on social media and you watch movies about perfect people having perfect lives, finding the love of their lives in a subway or something, I don't know, um, you tend to forget that you can be capable of having a normal life, of struggling with things and learning with that suffering, or maybe not. And, well, if you persevere in that way, without trying to be perfect and comparing yourself to other things, you live your own life. It won't be perfect, but it will be your life. And, as I said, a lot of times it won't be perfect, but as a friend of mine, as a friend of mine said, yeah, it will be imperfect, but it will be imper perfectly imperfect.